Welcome to My Life Chassidah Supplied, episode 501. This program is in loving memory of Miriam Baselio Altes, of HaShalom, and Merita Baruch bin Yomim ben Menuchalana Altes, Yukusil ben Leir Rochel and Rochel Bas Liba Farkash, dedicated by Pinchas Tadris ben Miriam and Sarah Bas Rochel Altes. Yes, we finished 500 episodes, and due to popular demand, we are uh, continuing our campaign to raise money to support this program in honor of the 500th episode, so you can continue to give generously. Please go to mylife500.com, where you can see our campaign, and please again generate, please Please dedicate and, and uh, sponsor and support us generously. Thank you so much. So, we are following Shavuos. We're ready now in the week of Pasha Shlach. As we continue our journey, literally the journey of Bamidbar, the journey that the Jewish people took through the wilderness as they traveled as with last week's Parsha Baal that we read yesterday, they continued their journey that began Parsha Pekude. The end of Parsha Pekude talked about how the Mishkan was established and they rested there. The Parshas after that till Baal Eschah talk about all the laws of firstly the establishment of the sanctuary of the Mishkan and then the, its dedication and the service within it. And now the Anon, the cloud ra- ra- rose and that indicated that they continued their journey which reflects, of course, our journey. And it fits very well. As they finished by Mount and Teda, they came to Har Sinai. And after Har Sinai, they continued their journey. After building the Mishkan, they continued the journey. And again, as I said, it reflects our journey. And being that Teda is Nitzchis, the eternal Teda, Teda Melosh Nehira, everything is a lesson to us in our lives. So these chapters pr- provide us with many, many lessons in the journeys of our lives. How to lead, how to that guide and direct our journey, how to deal with challenges, how to deal with difficulties. We all go through our own wilderness. We all go through our own difficulties. The wilderness is a place where there are, where there's a parched, arid land, sometimes very hostile to civilization. Nachash sort of akrov, filled with different dangerous elements, even. And yet we travel with the Arun that leads us. The Arun, the Torah leads us, the Torah Eir, that illuminates and protects and guides us through our lives. That's the general picture of where we are in the Torah in general, especially in this week's chapters. And of course, this is all very fitting to especially where we are now, fighting a war with enemies. We're going through our own Midbar. And it's not far from Midbar Sinai, if you think of where Gaza is situated. So all this is being relived, but we also tr- gain tremendous strength because we know we're not going alone. We have an Odin, and we have a cloud, a Nani HaKovet, that traveled before us and paved the way, prepared the way, straighten out, eliminate any of the challenges, any of the dangerous forces, any of the hostilities. And when you go with that strength, you can overcome any challenge and actually transform liabilities into assets. So that's a general lesson. But let's speak specifically more, what does this time period and Teda portion teach us today? With the opening question being, what can we learn from Parsha Shlach? So let's go back to the story of the journey. As we know, the journey is going from Mitzrayim to the Promised Land, to Eretz Yisrael. It would end up being 42 actual journeys. But that's it. They went, left Mitzrayim. The purpose of Yitzhak Mitzrayim was to come to Har Sinai and then continue the journey through the wilderness and ultimately that would prepare them by overcoming and transforming even a dark wilderness, even an arid wilderness, to transforming that to a place that the Jewish people traveled, a place where the Mishkan traveled with them, the portable Mishkan, which explains even though later the Beis Amidus would be built and that would be, temp- would be permanent on the Harabais, and Lossador will be permanent forever, but nevertheless there was a portable one. 
That demonstrated no matter where you are, even when you're on a journey, even when you're not necessarily in one place, you always have the Torah with you. And that helped them, as I said, pave the way. And finally they would come to the East River, the East Bank of the River Jordan. And then, as the Torah ends, Yeshua would lead them into Eretz Yisro. So where are we in this story? So as I said, in Baal Yisro, we learn about the journey continuing. And then Pasha Shlach, where Meshul Rabbeinu sends Meraglim, Shlach Lecho Anoshim, Lecho Ladaitachar, Hashem says. According to your calculation, send scouts to scout out the land. As the Ramban explains, before you conquer a land, you need to figure out what is the best way to enter, battles that have to be fought, where the weak points, the strong points of the enemy. So the Meraglim were there to scout out and prepare the ground. What does it mean in Ruchnius? It means that we all have to transform our lives, our material lives, into a promised, into a holy land, into holiness. But to do so, you have to scout it out. You have to analyze and evaluate to know what should be done, how it should be done, what's the best way for this transformation. So he sends those scouts. However, those scouts come back, even though they were pure of heart, they were the, they were the leaders. They were actually the leaders, the leaders of the tribes. But they come back, unfortunately, with a bad report. The report is that this is a land, it's a land that consumes its inhabitants. We can't do it. And they instigate the whole people of Israel to refuse to go. They don't want to, we'll be slaughtered there. Let us stay here in the wilderness. And the complaints begin, we should have never left Egypt. And you can imagine the wrath that that evoked in Shemayim. Yeshua and Kolov were two of the, the scouts that refused to go along with that. On the contrary, they said, Ola Naila, we can absolutely do it. We have Hashem's Kayach. God promised us. And it wasn't just a promise then. It was over the years, back going back to Avram Avinu. This turned into a tragic event. Bechil Adairis, we're told. You cried tonight, they, that night they cried about all. So God said this will be a Bechil Adairis for generations. That Tishabov. That was the first time there was a Tisha B'av. They cried that night about not wanting to go into the Holy Land. That would be the day, the night. That would be also tears that would flow because of the destruction of the temples and the five things the Mishnah enumerates in Tainus, Misach the Tainus. And in general, Tisha B'av, the saddest day of the Jewish calendar, all began with this refusal, this mutiny, if you wish. And Hashem ultimately says, okay, you don't want to go into Eretz Yisrael, you won't. And that was it, that they would all end up dying, that generation, in the Midbar, including Moshe, their leader with them. Though he was not part of this, obviously, but he was the captain of the ship, so to speak. And it would be the next generation that would enter. Only Kolov and Yeshua would be the ones that remain. Yeshua would actually lead the people into Eretz Yisrael. So what do we learn from this story? There's so many lessons in it. So first, a few questions. And then we can derive lessons that are extremely relevant today. Back, going back to the story of the journey of our lives. The first thing we learn and is after asking the, the obvious question, what's going on here? These were not simple scouts. They were great men. Moshe chose them. They went to scout the land. What happened here? And what was really their sin? What was the problem? They came back and gave a report. Unfortunately, it was a bad report. The problem was that no one asked them for conclusions. No one asked them whether we could enter the promised land. They were sent to figure out how, not whether. How to enter, not whether to enter. When God sends a soul down to earth, on earth there are going to be many challenges. The soul does not have a right to say, I don't want to go. We can't do it. I'm sending you, I'm giving you all the strengths that you, that you could do it. I'm not telling you it's going to be easy. I'm not asking you whether you go or not. You must go. You have to figure out how to do it. That was their big mistake. And it was because of their greatness. They saw it was a very material land, a materialistic land that would consume its inhabitants. Like we see people who are immersed in business in the Wall Street rush hour of life sometimes forget about their godly mission. 
The Meraglim said, why should we put ourselves at that risk? Here we can stay in, in, in the wilderness and study Torah, be protected by the clouds of glory. So it was their greatness, actually, that worked against them. Now, what was Moshe's intention? Especially knowing that God says, Ledaitacha, lecha. If God said, send scouts, he could say, I'm relying on God. But God is saying, do it at your discretion. So he should have immediately said, something's wrong here. Why is God not telling me that? So all over the Torah, it doesn't say, Ledaitacha, Dabar el Bnei Yisrael, Tzavaz Bnei Yisrael, not Ledaitacha, not at your discretion. This is my command, the different mitzvahs. Because here the whole point was that you have to figure out how to do it on your own. I've given you the promises. I've given you all the, uh, the, the assurances that you'll be able to conquer the land. Now you have to figure out how to. And Is there a risk? There is a risk. And unfortunately, look what happened. So the first thing we learn from this is that we are placed on a journey in this world. This journey begins with Hashem sending... God sending your soul to this world. Is this a difficult world? Yes. That's why al kar the neshama doesn't want to come to this world. Imagine living in Elam Haba in Gan Eden, in paradise. No health issues, no financial issues, no corruption, no conflicts, no psychological issues, no traumas, no pain, no suffering. You look down in this world and say, who would want to come to a world like this? Shem says, no. I'm telling you, you have to go. Because that's what I want. Nisava Kodesh Baruch Uli Yisleh is Baruch Dira B'Tachtenim. The Ebesha desired to have a Dira Tachtenim and Tachtenim as the Alter Rebbe explains in Tanya chapter 36. Tachten Shein Tachten Lamatam Emenu. Nothing lower than this world. Not just that it's a low world. It's the lowest of low. And yet that's where I want my home. My Mishkin, my home. And I'm giving you the power to do so. Mashbiyin Eisei Teit Tzadik Val Teirosh Mashbiyin also comes from the word I'm saving you, I'm feeding you, I'm nourishing, nurturing you, giving you all the strengths that you need. When Moshe asked Hashem, how could we do it? So Hashem says, I'm not asking you to do something according to my abilities, I'm asking you to do something according to your abilities. If I tell you, you can, that to do it, that means I'm giving you all the strengths. It would be axodious, it would be cruel to give someone a mission knowing that they can't do it. Why would you do that? So you have all the strengths. But don't make the mistake of using your own logic and saying it's too difficult. You could say it's difficult, but I know if it's difficult, I have to dig deeper and find deeper strengths. There'll be plenty of challenges. It's a land that consumes its inhabitants. It's a corrupt world. And the corruption often affects people. But you have the strength. If you connect it above, you don't fall below. As Kolov and Yeshua said, connect as the, as the psukim elaborate. And when you connect, we can, all in all, not just go, to go in an elevated state, a double elevated state. We have all the strengths we need, but we have to access them. And first is the complete mun and betochen, faith and trust, that we can do it. So today we have the same situation. It's a different stage of the wilderness, a different stage of enemies, and hostilities. We have to know absolute confidence, number one, that we will prevail as we've always have. If we're connected to Torah, we're connected to Hashem. We're not just going with our own strengths. It's not We go with God's power. But it's, it's, a, but it's not a war through, through arms and through strength. It's a war beruach, a spirit. And when we go with that, we definitely will prevail. Is it a challenge? It is a challenge. So that's the first lesson. We don't ask whether, we ask how. And I've seen it with my own eyes when I visited the soldiers near Gaza. And you could see it, their enthusiasm. There's no ifs, buts, maybe. It's the politicians that are waffling. So it's a lesson to them as well. This is a good cause. This is a cause that's protecting innocent lives, including lives of Muslims and Arabs and Gazans. You're dealing with evil. You're dealing with atrocities. But the war is more than just protecting ourselves. The war is about bringing God to this world. That was the journey through the wilderness. And the journey through the, through the Sinai wilderness and through Gaza and through all 
the different stops they made. And to build a Mishkan, to build a Beis Amigdash, to transform this world into a, whole, into a divine home, into a divine sanctuary. So that's lesson number one, what we learned from Pastor Shlach. What can we do, someone asks, during today's war and unrest to not repeat the same mistake as the scouts? As the Meraglim. Even though the Meraglim had good intentions and wanted to give advice that would protect and save lives, they made a big mistake and went against Moshe Rabbeinu's orders. They were supposed to scout the land and advise the best and safest route, route to get in and not scare everyone with a false assessment that the task of entering the land was impossible because they saw people eating giant grapes. As we know, nothing is impossible if we have Hashem's blessings. I echo that completely. You answer your own question. Is by connecting exactly to that promise. It's not just because we're powerful and we have a strong army and we're smarter. It's because we have a cause that's not our own. We don't go with our own strength. We go with God's blessings. And that's what you heard from the Rebbe time and again before the Six Day War and before the Yom Kippur War and, after the, and during the wars and other challenges. That this is a land that watches, God watches specifically and supervises over more than any other place on earth, the safest place on earth. But that's when you connect to that. How else can you overcome such challenges? I mean, you connect with that. That's the message of Shlach. But with that strength that Hashem is giving you this power, that allows you to overcome any challenge. And this is not just a, a religious statement, a statement of faith. It's also a strategic one. It's a military one. Every military needs to know its cause, its purpose, and knows fighting the right, the, the, the battle for right, and for, for over right, over wrong. By fighting a good battle, meaning a battle of good. It's a good cause, an important cause, a critical cause. When soldiers and people in the military don't know that, how could you really fight with confidence? War is, is bloody, it's painful. There are losses. The only way you can counter that is because you know the cause is more important than anything. And unfortunately, we have enemies and you have to deal with that. Someone else's question is like this. After the sin of the scouts, why were the Jews not given a chance to do tshuva? More detail, dear Rabbi Jacobson. Last year I submitted a question about why the generation that listened to the Miraglim was punished so harshly and not allowed into Eretz Yisrael and had to die in the desert. Your answer made sense. It's not a punishment, you said, but rather cause and effect. Once that entire generation showed a lack of faith in Hashem and a fear of military battle, they basically revealed that they were not qualified to conquer the land. Like the projection. Since we appeared as grasshoppers, as insects. They saw the giants and they saw that they looked at us like that. In other words, it was our own subjective limitation. Once you feel that way, you bring on your own problems. So, and so they had to wait 40 years for the next generation to do it, to enter the land. But I still had a question as to why they weren't given a chance to do tshuva and correct their mistakes. And grow from it. And if they succeeded in their tshuva, then they would be qualified to conquer the land. I'm afraid that if Mashiach didn't come 30 years ago, how can we be assured that Hashem didn't decide, hasn't decide, didn't decide that our generation also is not qualified to bring Mashiach and has to wait until the next generation? Okay, so this is a twofold question here. Let's first answer the first question. You can always do tshuva. But they didn't do tshuva. That's the problem. Second point. There's a reason for that too. They were not yet ready. They had the schus and merit to make themselves ready, but they weren't. They were still in the shadow of that fear and feeling that the land was too strong for them. So they didn't merit it. But that doesn't mean their children didn't. And children are an extension of their parents. So they had the power they left Mitzrayim. And there was a lot of great qualities that that generation had. Derdeya 
an enlightened generation that received Torah, built the Mishkan, many great things that they did. But like it is with all generations, it's accumulative. And then the next generation had the maturity and the strength to enter. So there's two sides. They could have done tshuva, and had they done, things would have been different. And we know that if Moshe Rabbeinu had gone to Eretz Mashiach would have come. You see this throughout history. Every generation that Mashiach didn't come, like the Yerushalmi says, a generation that has not rebuilt the base of Midrash is as if they destroyed it. But that doesn't mean the next generation cannot do it. On the contrary, we must do it with the strength from those that came before us. As far as now goes, didn't come 30 years ago. We have to go back to the key point is God created the world and he gave us a mission and he gave us strength. The fact that something didn't work for whatever reason doesn't mean firstly that it didn't work. It meant steps were done but maybe not enough. Doors were opened but not all the doors. That's number one. Number two, there's no such thing as giving up. This is a one-way street. This is a street that's going toward Geula. That God's purpose for existence will prevail will be realized. It's a basic amuna, basic yisod of everything. If one believes in God, you have to believe that God's purpose will be revealed. However, we're partners in it. And we can either speed up the process or unfortunately slow it down. So our attitude, it doesn't matter 30 years. Of course, we have questions. Why now, if it didn't happen till now? But that doesn't mean we give up. We continue the journey. That's the key thing. By yisod. The Jews broke into four camps when they came to the Red Sea. Stuck in front of them, between a hard, rock and a hard place, the sea before them, the Egyptians pursuing them. And they go into philosophical mode. Some said, let's return, surrender, and re- resign ourselves, go back to Egypt. Some said, let's kill ourselves and throw ourselves into the, into the river, to the sea. Some said, let's go to war. And some said, let's pray. And the Hashem rejects them all. Why you so move forward? I gave you a job. This is a journey. Remember, a journey. Masoyes. Move forward. And then things happen. The sea parted. And that's been this the motto. This has been the, the, the ethic, the ethos of the Jewish people from the beginning of time throughout history. They had the harshest of times. Of course, how so easy to give up after the Holocaust, after the pogroms, after being expelled and killed and all that persecution we went through the generations. By Yusau, we move forward. And we have the strength to do so. And we turn to our leaders and we turn to our Rebbe in each generation to continue to lead us and, and seek out that guidance and strength and fortitude. There really is no other option. The other option is to sink, God forbid. So we don't look and say, because they didn't go into that so we, we've already gone through enough. And we already have the accumulation of all the mitzvahs nefesh and the sacrifices and the prices paid and the mitzvahs done and everything. And all the people that died for their faith. How many yisudim? How much persecution? How much affliction? How much oppression we had to endure? So all that comes together and accumulates and erupts into what we call a gu'ul amitis vashlema. And that's where we're at that threshold. And what happened yesterday can only look at one way. Learn from it, do better, and build on it because it all accumulates into that big picture called Mashiach. Because remember, it's a process, not just an event. The process of Masenu Bavid Deseinu, as the Alter Rebbe says in the beginning of chapter 37 in Tanya. All our efforts, all our work, all our Veda comes together, building blocks. And at some point, all those building blocks accumulate and the sum total is Geula, putting the Aleph of Aluf Shalalim, of godliness, of Agdus, into Geula, turns it into Geula into Geula. So Geula is made up of the very fabric, of the very building blocks of Geula. Okay. I'm a, someone asks another question in this context. It says that Hashem wouldn't allow King David. Well, the way someone put it was this. Is it possible that the Gula will be delayed due to our mistakes today? So here's how somebody puts it. It says that Hashem wouldn't allow King David to build the Beis Amidus because David's generation was involved with war. 
Therefore, we had to wait until the next generation for King Shlemet to have a, to build a base amigdash. This begs a question about our generation. We are currently involved in a big war in Gaza. Even though we didn't start the war and want the war, and it's a war purely of self-defense against the Hamas terrorists, it's still a war with bloodshed. Could this mean that Hashem might delay revealing Mashiach and the third base amigdash until the next generation that is not involved with war? God forbid, absolutely not. That was a one-time experience, David HaMelech and Shleimah. And remember, after all those generations, and all the blood shed, not that we shed, that others shed of our blood, we are in a very different place. We were Zeche, like the Rebbe said, Shalom Long. It's really a long time that we call it, that Kolo Kola Kitsim, Veena Dova Tal El Betshuva, and Nidim De Tshuva, and we went through a tremendous Yisurim in the worst possible way. So to God forbid say that. So we have David doing, his, doing what he did, and we have what Shlema Zaveda, and now we're ready to go into the Gula without any hesitation. There's no other generation. This is the Deir Ashvi that Rebbe said, the Deir Achrin and Golas, Deir Arishin of Gula. And exactly like you say, if an enemy comes to you, you defend yourself. That's not in the category of bloodshed exactly. Dovid HaMelech is a story of its own. As I said, a one-time thing has many lessons to be learned from that. We are not a warlike people. We're not a people who are here to shed blood. After what, what, what has been done to us, it's minimal what is the response, frankly. But regardless, if anything, this is the last steps to eliminate all evil, so we could have already Mashiach and the Gula as was promised. Being that yesterday was Baal Eishcho, let me talk a few questions about Baal Eishcho, that to respond to a few questions. And continuing on, what, what do we learn from lighting the Meneda until the flames rise on their own? The first Rashi in last week's Parsha, yesterday's Parsha, not not ignite, kindle the flames, but raise them to make sure that the shalhevis, that you have to light the candle to the point that the flame rises on its own. As we see, it takes an extra split second. So wait. That's the importance of that word, as the Rebbe explains at length. This is the essence of all education and all inspiration and all influence. We don't just teach people how to th- what to think, but how to think. We're not just teaching people facts and data, but methodology that they can rise on their own. That you stand on your own feet. Not just give you answers to questions, but give you the ability to answer questions. Empowerment. That's what the Pesach says. So you light the Meneda. The Meneda represents Neir Hashem Nishma Sodom, lighting someone's Neshama. And Neir Mitzvah V'Tereh, the candle of Mitzvah and the light of Tereh. That don't just illuminate someone, but empower them, get their neshama alive. Get their neshama alight. Kindle. You're not even giving it to them. You're igniting that which is there already, their pilot flame, to burn, to fan those flames, to burn light brightly, that they can spread their wings and use their kaychas, like the daitacha, to achieve what they uniquely can achieve. So that's one of the most important lessons of that. And that applies as well now. We talk about mentioning 30 years from Gimel Tammuz. So it has a certain tinge of, more than a tinge, it's quite sad. But then the day we cannot just be overcome by sadness. We don't get, we don't paralyze, we don't lie down and die, God forbid. We use it as a catalyst that propels us, but we must do more. And perhaps this whole period is really the demonstration. What are you going to do on your own, so to speak? We're never on our own. Hashem is with us. Our Rebbe is with us. But Begoli, it's a helm. It's not like it was before Gimel Thomas. But now is the test. What would you do when you don't have those Giluyim? When you don't have someone holding your hand or someone that's constantly reminding you? Can you generate it from within? And that too is coming from the power of above. We have to always know that. But there's a need, like the Rebbe said, put in Tavshim Amzayin, and again, Chav Ches Nisan Tavshim Nun Aleph. 
Two thousand of a seer can't. I did everything I can do. Now it goes over. What are we going to do? And you'll say, what can I do compared to the Rebbe? That's what the Kavan is. What can you do compared to the Ebishter? But he wants you to make a Dira B'Tachtenim. Not he should make the Dira B'Tachtenim. And Tafkin Tachtenim. But knowing that we have all the Kechas, even if it's a dark wilderness, and a Chesher Kofla Mechupal, a quadruple darkness, and Tachten Shein Tachten Lematim Emenu. What are you going to do? And I saw the B'Tei V'Sicha in Tovshin Mem Dalad. And Gimel, the Rebbe spoke about this and said the ultimate is when you don't have anything that's giving you any reason to be in Golis, Shainer Rabbe Mem Dalad, I should say, and Asar B'Tei Mem Gimel. That is completely coming from you, not from any other place. That's why my, uh, uh, Yaakov Avinu wanted to reveal the cats. Hashem said, no. It has to come from us. There's some initiative that has to come from below. That's what makes it internalized, premiistic, and ultimately fulfills the kavana. Is it more pleasant if it's given to us on a platter? Of course. But Adam Reitzah B'Kav Shalei Yesu Metisha Kam Shal Chaveri Something about Veda B'Kei Echatz Me'eleha L'Daitacha So that's the lesson from that. From my, 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 shall have a Salem Elah. Another question. What was the deeper spiritual complaint when the Jews complained to Moshe that they didn't like the man and they wanted to go out and get and, and, and to go out and get them some meat? And then Moshe says, Ma'ayinli Basar, and that's when the Abishta tells him, you should gather 70, the 70 sages, the Skenim, and impart, Vatsaltim in Aruach, impart from your spirit, from Moshe's spirit to them. So that, if you hear the word Vatsalti, that's where the word Atsilis comes from. The deeper meaning behind this is all, it's not just they wanted meat, a change of uh, diet, a change of menu. The man tasted like all the different tastes. There's all kinds of explanations on a practical level, on a pshat level. But the deeper level is that the Jews knew, especially after Matan Teda, that the kavana is to transform the material world into a dira b'tachtenim. They just had built a mishkin, which is all about that, to take kes of zovin cheshes, not spiritual materials, physical materials, and to turn it into v'osili migdosh v'shachanti b'sechem. Build for me a sanctuary and I will reside, dwell among you. So though the man was a tremendous miracle, lechem in ashamayim, but as we know, it's a very spiritual food. They didn't have to digest it. There was no waste. And all the other qualities of the man, Chassidus explains at length what lechem in ashamayim is. But the kavon is lechem in aretz. Even though lechem in ashamayim is gishmake, because you don't have to even work for it. It's coming from heaven. You don't have bezeis apecha techa lechem. You don't have to sweat like the Maraglim wanted. They wanted to stay in a Ruchanistic environment, spiritual environment. But they knew the Kavon is Dafke, not just Lechem and Hashemayim, but meat, Bosar. Especially Bosar, because that's the deepest Nitzutzis. That's why it's, that's why until the Mabel, they were not allowed to eat meat. They didn't have the power to elevate such dark, such, such Nitzutzis in such a dark place. They knew that. So they come to Meisha. We're ready now, after we've gone through the Teda was given to, to the refined people who were eating Man. Man is like Shabbos. Higher than Pseilis, higher than Waste, higher than Bidudim, as Chassidus explains. Now we're ready for, we're prepared to, we're ready to prepare to go into the Promised Land. There was going to be Lechem in Oretz, Bosar, physical, not just spiritual food, so to speak. Moshe Rabbeinu, who of course led them, asked the question, I only bossed. I live in the world of Ruchnis. Teda. Moshe Kippel Teda Messinai. So that's where the Ebrister says, Vatsalti Minarua, Chosfer Lechot, gather together, Shev Shirim Tzadikim. What is the role of Atsilis, Chsidis explains? It's an interface between Ruchnis, 
Tin el yenim and tachtenim. Tin ruchnis and gashmis ultimately. On one hand, that silas is ayilam ha'achdus. It's a unified world. It's a world of elokus. On the other hand, there's ten spheres that will evolve into the ten spheres of Bria, and then ten spheres of Yitzira, and ten spheres of Asiya, all the way into creating Asara, Mamoris, Nivra, Elam, the ten statements that create this world, including Basar and, and, and all the physical matter, in order to elevate it. So Atzillus stands as like an interface between Tachtenim and Elyenim. So Mesh on his own, yes, it's above that, but the Abishta says Vatsalti. Initially, we hear that the Alter Rebbe didn't want Chesidim to ask him for Gashmi's Dikr Brachis, Ruchni's Dikr things. And then the Alter Rebbe said, no, he's also there for Gashmi's Dikr things. Because ultimately, Dira Betachtenim, the Kavon is to connect Al Yenim and Tachtenim in one of the Sikhs of the Friedrich Rebbe, someone asked the Friedrich Rebbe, Shvus Sikhe. What did Matan Teda accomplish in Moshe Rabbeinu? What accomplished for the Eden, it gave them the power to transform the material world into a spiritual. What did it accomplish for Moshe who was such a, on such a high level? And the Friedrich Rebbe answered, as a as a he should recognize the mile of Ish Poshet. Not that he didn't know, but Matan Teda gave, drove that point home. El Yenim, connecting to Tachtenim. So the Chathila Ma'ainli Bosar. Where am I going to find Bosar? What connection do I have to Bosar? Are you coming to me for, for meat? For flesh? For a steak? But the Abishta says, yeah, you're the Nasi Bisral. You have to ultimately be the mocker of all Ashbas. But how? Through Atsilus, through Atsaltim and Aruach. Briefly. So that's the deeper meaning of that, which again goes back to the theme that continues in Pasha Shlach. Now, time to enter the promised land. But then they hesitated. They were afraid. The material world, Eretz Echel which was what we spoke about earlier. But when you stand strong with Hashem's Kayach, the Ebesh is higher than Al Yenim and Tachtenim, and gives us the power to transform Tachtenim, make it a Dirale is Baruch with Tachtenim. Okay. Being that. There are many questions that keep coming in about events in the Middle East and that's Israel. So let's address some of those. Here's a question that was asked in continuation of a discussion I've been having the last before, the last weeks. Should we move to Israel? So I spoke about it, the Rebbe's directives regarding this, and about the different nuances, the different aspects. That Sasson asked a question, a follow-up. I'm a big fan of your YouTube video series. which I have been following for the last two years or so. I gain much information and strength from your videos and anticipate having the chance to finally read your books when I have a break. I work in Jewish communications and currently I'm working for the largest conservative synagogue in North America, located in Toronto, Canada. Recently, you made a video about whether or not Jews should leave America for Israel. As an outside Canadian observer, I agreed with the points made in the video. In regards to Canada, though, versus the U.S., I am not sure how I feel right now. Part of this is based on the fact that I have so many communications with so many Jewish people who are not willing to publicly share their experiences, such as my cousin who teaches in public schools as a, as a supply teacher. As a supply teacher, he has a unique perspective from visiting numerous schools. I reached out to him after he was quoted in the Canadian Jewish News, and his response was that he, only, that he had only shared the most innocuous of his experiences of anti-Semitism, and left out details such as his students giving the fascist salute and saying, Heil Yimach I don't want to repeat it to him. Amongst other things, Canada has historically been a more anti-Semitic country than the United States. My own perspective on this matter is also influenced by not just my time in communications, but also a previous career as a professional musician. As a musician, I, network and met, I networked and met many hundreds of other Canadian musicians. In the last de decade, since I made it publicly known that I'm Jewish and stand with the State of Israel, I lost at a minimum 400 or so of these connections, about 95% plus of the musicians who I know. The few remaining musicians who I'm in contact with are either Jewish or political centrists. The vast majority of musicians in this country are somewhere between far left-wing and left-wing. 
My wife and I are trying to buy our first house in the Toronto area. We have a one-year-old son who we plan to send to Hebrew day school rather than subjecting him to worsening anti-Semitism in the public school system. When I was in school, until the point where I became one of the tallest kids in my school, I was regularly subjected to taunts of kike and jokes about being thrown into the oven. In the end, I made many friends who were ethnic minorities who also faced open racism and a few Jewish friends. Our neighborhoods has had swastikas painted in it and have been verbally accosted by strangers because I wear a kippah. My wife has been stalked because she has been sh seen shopping for Hanukkah items in a non-Jewish store. I was wondering if you might have a chance to share your thoughts about the difference in the experience of Jewish anti-Semitism in the United States versus Canadian. He meant American anti-Semitism, I guess, uh, U.S. anti-Semitism versus Canadian. At a birthday party for my son yesterday, the majority of guests were Jewish, including one who was in the conversion process, and someone made a joke next year in Miami, which I feel summed up a lot of our feelings. So going back to this central question, um, before I get into the difference of anti-Semitism, the question of is, is, uh, is Canada different than the USA, let me talk about the general picture firstly. Whether moving from your place where you live to another place is a very personal question that has many details to it. It's case by case. There's no one size fits all. Certain principles I laid out based on the Rebbe's approach. If you're needed where you are, especially in a communal role, community leader, an educator, a fundraiser that's necessary for an organization, people dependent on you, a mentor, a rabbi, and so on, it's a big question. You can't just pick yourself up because you have responsibilities. If you're a business person who can do business anywhere in the world, or you've made enough money that you can live anywhere you want, it's another story. And even there, we have to take into consideration your children, education of your children. Are they already all married? What does your spouse say? So it's very difficult in a program like this to just give an answer. All of that takes into consideration. Should we go because of anti-Semitism? Fear is never the only reason. Is it a factor? It's a factor among many other factors. But not out of fear. Because we always have to show strength, and sometimes the strength, you think you can't be in Israel, and also have fear. And that's critical. That's what the Rebbe's advice were people in South Africa, even when there was domestic challenges, or in Russia, you know, former Soviet Union, and so on. That's a general statement, whether you're living in Canada or the United States or in South Africa or in the Soviet Union or anywhere else in the world. We talked about Nazi Europe. Obviously, if people are literally, you're in Mamish in danger, Pekuach Nefesh, in the most immediate sense of the word, that's, Pekuach Nefesh is always overrides anything. And that's not even about going to Israel, that's just getting out of harm's way. So we spoke about that. So in that context, I don't think there's a difference between Canada and the United States. As far as the actual anti-Semitism, I'm not so familiar with what you write, but I understand that Canada is more of a, I guess, more provincial, and therefore could be a lot more, anti-Semitism could be a lot more blatant. So it's another factor, but again, there's a strong Jewish community in Toronto, in Montreal, and other places, and we have responsibilities. And not just your own personal responsibility as part of the, as, as not only your communal responsibility, but also that you have neighbors. Imagine people all run, not everybody can leave. We have to be responsible for each other. So again, I cannot advise whether you should go or not. I think that you have to sit down with mentors, people who know your life and know all the details, know your own circumstances, and make a decision based on that. But it's not a simple decision because, again, a community is stronger with more people there. Can we just say, you know what, everyone who can leave should leave. What about those that can't? And it weakens their security and their role and their ability to do what they have to do. So all that needs to be taken into account. And again, this is not in any way minimizing the differences. You know, you hear in Europe, some of the countries, anti-Semitism more blatant than in other places. That also has to be taken into account. That's the general approach I would take to this, to this question. And if you want to follow up, by all means, please do so. So another question is regarding the war in general. I've gotten a whole bunch of questions about 
how we should deal with the battles, one extreme or the next extreme. So, let me say this. Someone asked the question, Dear Rabbi Jacobson, and this is, why not conquer all of Gaza and settle it with Jews? Jews worldwide care about Israel. Those of us who have the merit to live here in Israel and who have kids who serve in the IDF, such as myself, are especially invested. This brings me to my question. It is clear to anyone with an ounce of brains that it's not merely Hamas who are our mortal enemies, but all of the Palestinian quote-unquote people. Not only is Hamas their natural outgrowth and natural leadership party, but civilians were involved. Minar Zokin in the thousands from young to old in the thousands, in the frenzies of atrocities on October 7th, Shemini Atzeda Simchas They raped, murdered, burned, tortured, mutilated, and stole. Palestinian children were, wit- were witnessed burning Jewish homes. Those who didn't enter Israel cheered from the sidelines. Hamas still has overwhelming support of the Palestinians in Gaza and in Judea and Samaria. Samaria. With all this in mind, why won't our government clearly state that our wars with the Palestinian people and the man demanded they be relocated or killed. Tim Chazechra Amalek, erase the memory of Amalek. The Western idea of not harming civilians is not a Torah idea. We don't see this anywhere in Torah. In addition, this civilian population is hell bent on destroying us. So while not in many army, not while not in army fatigues, they are not innocent civilians. There are evidently many countries who support them: Ireland, Norway, Spain, Sweden, South Africa, Bahamas, Trinidad and Tobago. Jamaica, Barbados, Mexico, Colombia, Thailand, Yemen, and Iran. So they can take So they will obviously always take the side against Israel. That's the situation. So then the best case scenario of the Palestinians remain, Gaza will have a terrorist insurgency and will be an endless war forever. basically asking about what we do. Our leaders are not, are not bright, articulate people. They're filled with foolish ideas and the result foolish policies that are allowing terror to control and affect the Jews in our holy land. So look, I am not going to speak from a military strategy point of view. Um, the fact that the world talks about civilians, part of it is definitely an anti-Israel position because they don't talk about it when it came to World War II and other times, or even nowadays. At the same time, we're not looking to kill civilians, even if we don't even know what a civilian means. But I totally agree that war can only be fought in a complete way. You can't fight with one hand tied behind your back. I would not call for a destruction of entire Gaza, Firstly, I never heard the Rebbe speak in that language. But I would call for strength. You shouldn't need to do that because they see you're serious. If they think you're waffling and you show weakness, then unfortunately it's only going to get worse. But totally agree that it's an enemy. When, when someone declares war against you, even if there are so-called civilians in that country that have not declared, but they're part of the, that country. That country has declared war, and you have to treat that country as a country that's at war with you. You can't say that because there were some Germans who may have been against Hitler, that that's why Germany should be saved because Germany, you don't want to kill civilians. Germany right now is under the control of people who declared war against you. And you have to fight war and engage in war in that way. No one's looking to kill anyone. We'd rather not have this whole thing. But unfortunately, politics comes in, pressures come in, and at the end of the day, yes, you need leaders who are very resolute and understand they're fighting the right. They're on the right side and they're fighting the correct war, a good war. I don't mean a good war as a war is good, but I mean for the good cause. And that's the bottom line. There's nothing else more, less or more to say about that. Someone else asked the question, the other way, not the other way, the... Should do, are we allowed to launch missiles from our backyards into Gaza to help the war effort? So I don't know if this is a tongue-in-cheek question or not. Uh, I would definitely consult with the military experts on that. I don't think anyone should take it in their own hands. 
this is a serious war, and you have to be very careful of what you do and what you don't do. That's my short answer on that. Talking about self-defense is self-defense. But, but beyond that, there's, that's why you have a military. You have to have experts. You have thing, thing has to be planned with strategy. Okay. Someone asked the question the other way around. Should we try to shower the Gazans with kindness? Here's the way the person put it. If Ruth converted from a religion of Aved because Naomi was nice to her and saved her life when she was homeless and starving, is there a lesson for us to learn on how to peacefully coexist with our neighbors in Gaza? Perhaps instead of dropping bombs on them, we should do the opposite and shower them with kindness. Please, do me a favor. You can't even make a comparison between the two. Ruth did not declare war on Naomi or on the Jewish people. On the contrary. Here you're talking about people who declared war. Yeah, I wish we could find those individuals or those children that are not declared war and are completely innocent. But it's all embedded and they're using civilians as shields. So I don't even see how this, this question is relevant at all. I know that's not the approach. The best way to show them kindness is to get rid of the enemies who are also enemies of their own. And if they're not their enemies, if they consider those people who are perpetrating these atrocities as friends, then they're also our enemies. Okay. Next question. Would the Rebbe advise everyone in Israel living in the path of missiles from Gaza or Hezbollah in the north to check their mezuzahs? Absolutely. But not only them, everyone. And all of that's just on all over the world, for that matter. A mezuzah is a mitzvah. It has also the zgula, the feature of adding protection. So that's not a question. It's one of the, one of the mitzvahs of mezuzah came after a terrorist attack in the north of Israel. So the answer is absolutely yes. Let's see, what else do we have here? <coughs> So, are our prayers working in helping free the hostages and win the war in Gaza? So I got a few questions about that. Let me address that. So someone asked like this. What good are the blessings of Kahanim if the blessings don't work in a way that we can see them with our physical eyes within the parameters of the physical war we exist in? A few months ago, I asked the Kohen to bless all the remaining hostages, that all the remaining hostages should be safely returned home within 24 hours. He did the full blessing with all three verses of Yevarah It's been a few months and no good news yet. When we read Parsha Nosei, which was a few weeks ago, and it comes to the part where Aaron and his sons bless the Jews, I plan on turning my back to the Bimim protest. The only way I will change my mind is if every single hostage is safely freed immediately. If Hashem wants to punish me for my disrespect, then fine. But I believe Hashem began punish me already in, punish me already in advance on October 7th. Every day that the hostages are not returned, I suffer because I care about them. Enough nonsense already. May their suffering end and may their safety safely return home today. That's part one. Then the same person writes the following, which I appreciate. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, a few days ago I wrote an anonymous note to this forum complaining that our prayers, including the blessings of Kahanim, were not working to help the ras- to rescue the hostages. And I plan to turn my back to the Bima during Kriya Satayda in silent protest. However, today's news headlines report, this was written a few weeks ago, that the IDF special forces made a daring and difficult raid into Gaza and were able to successfully rescue four hostages alive. I therefore retract my earlier statement, and instead of protesting, I will dance around the bima and sing Heidu Lashem Kitev Kilei Elam Chazde. May this good news be contagious and keep spreading every day until all the hostages are safely rescued and peace is restored. I want to use this forum to apologize for what I wrote when I was angry and say thank you to Hashem for hearing our prayers. Okay, so this speaks again for itself. I want to conclude with one follow-up. Well, before I say that, let me say one more thing. Prayers always help. The question is whether you see it immediately or it takes time. It's like opening doors. Sometimes you need more doors opened. So don't ever give up. As much as we may have kindness and complaints to Hashem, we also need Hashem more than ever. And that's our relationship, to invoke and do whatever we can to get God to help, to free us all the hostages safely, 
and to end this whole war and nightmare. And we should only have Shalom. I want to conclude with one thing. There's a follow-up. In episode 498, like by Amy, you discussed why the 24,000 students of Rabbi Kiva died in the epidemic. Not, on, not honoring a fellow person is not an excusable offense. You seemingly, you seem to struggle to find an answer. Why their crime of not respecting each other would deserve such a punishment. The Rebbe discusses this in the Kutasikh, volume 32, Lagba Emir, and answers it based on the Yerushalmi Sanhedrin. So, what the Rebbe says there is Take, he, he discusses this question, and I thank you for that. And he says, he brings the Yerushalmi that it's not just due to their not respecting, it's also due to the time that it's all 24,000 together. And therefore, that was the fact that was like a special time period that was a, a negative time period that added to the whole problem. You can look it up there on the Kutasichas. But we want to always be Messiah and Betev. The key thing is to remember that the Tikkun for that is Avis Yisrael, Lagba Emer, and then the Avis Kish Echad Belev Echad Avis Yisrael, Matan Teda. And now as we continue in the journey from Matan Teda to Eretz Yisrael, it should be immediate that we should have the Gula Mitis Vashlema even before the end of Parsha Masay. And we should do our part in learning Teda, be Mekayim Mitzvahs, Zdoke, Tefillah, as well as learning Chesidus and spreading Chesidus, Yifutza Manisech HaChutza, in which merit will come, Osimar do Malka Meshich, that Meshich promised the Baal Shem Tov. Everyone have a very good week. This has been My Life Chesidus Applied. We're here every Sunday, 8 to 9 p.m. Kol Tov and only Baruchas. This program is brought to you by My Life Chesidus Applied. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at chassidusapply.com slash donate.